Hey everybody, it's your pal Mike Zombie, and this week we're going to talk about Life Force from 1985. The real truth of this is, I just recorded a review of this film. It was 27 minutes long because I kept being interrupted by shit outside my house. I kept walking out back and forth telling everybody to shut the fuck up or I was going to cut their goddamn throats. And I kept coming back in and forgetting where I was in my review. So a half hour out the window, I'm going to do it again much faster, much more streamlined. Okay, first off, thanks to Paul, new listener, for calling in, or I'm sorry, emailing Daryl and saying, hey, you guys should check out Life Force from 85. I'd never seen it. Daryl had seen it, and the way he put it across to me was, well, it's okay. I, I had it confused with Cocoon. I thought it was the Wilford Brimley oatmeal diabetes guy. And Daryl's like, no, 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 that's that's Cocoon. And many of you emailed in, called in with movies we should watch. A handful of those are films that I'd already done maybe a year ago, two years ago, whatever. So I, I chose Paul's entrance of Life Force because I'd never seen it. And Daryl said there's all kinds of titties in this film. That's a direct quote, by the way. And <laughs> so thank you to everybody who emailed in, called in. I appreciate it. And we will be sending prizes out. Daryl sent me a message saying he's getting the prize closet organized and going to figure out who's going to get what. I have no idea. It's at his house. I get stuff. I send it to him. I don't hold on to this stuff. So Life Force of 85. I'm really going to try to wrap this up in under like 10 minutes because I just did a 27. Fuck that. This was a good film. I liked it. It's getting like almost six stars from 10,000 people on IMDb, which is really good. Now, directed by Toby Hooper, who, of course, I know him from... Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacres, but also screenplay was written by Dan O'Bannon, who holds a special place in my heart. He passed away a while ago. He directed Return of the Living Dead. I think he also wrote the screenplay for that, which uh, was my first zombie film that I ever really got into. So I already knew I was going to like this film. It's about, I guess, a space shuttle. I forget the name of it. One of those noble names composed of U.S. and U.K. scientists and Air Force headed to Halley's Comet to take some samples. So this would have been 1986, though the film came out in 85. It, w- it was unspoken. What it, it would have been 86. 86 was the last time ha- Halley's was close. Not, is it Halley's or Halley's? I've heard it both ways. Fuck it. He's dead. Who cares? So when they arrived, they realized there's a 150 mile spaceship also cruising along with the comet. So for some reason, they can't contact Earth. They decide, let's go investigate. So they put in their spacesuits, go inside the spaceship at the end, They kind of go up its ass, to be honest, and they find a bunch of dead, large bats inside, bat-like creatures floating around. And they also find a little further, and this ship is very much, it's Giger-esque, which doesn't really surprise me. It was probably written that way because Dan O'Bannon also wrote the screenplay for Alien and worked with Giger on that. So I can see a lot of O'Bannon stuff looking like, you know, Alien. I mean, that's what he did. Alien, I think Aliens and something else, but... Inside this ship, they find three almost crystal cases of humanoids. They look just like humans, two men and a woman, and they're naked and they're just they look perfectly alive, but they're not. We don't think they bring them back to the ship as this ship as the big ship outside the spaceship starts to unfold and do all this crazy weird shit. It's very obvious. It's articulating. It's alive. And we suddenly cut to NASA 30 days later with no explanation as we see this space shuttle come cruising up onto Earth. But something's wrong. It's tilting a little bit. It's dark. There's no running lights. What the fuck is going on? They don't know. So uh, and one of the one of the technicians at NASA looking at his computer says, you know, it looks like they set the coordinates for Earth just after leaving the comet, but have made no adjustments since. So. They send up another shuttle. Funny to see the shuttles now after they're out of commission. Kind of funny. Goes up, docks, and finds the whole thing has been burnt on the inside. Scorched. Everything is burnt up. The records, the computers, and and all, all the crew are all crispy critters sitting in their chairs. So it's kind of weird to me that a ship would have made it that far with no guidance and no obvious propulsion system or anything. Everything's burnt up. No computers. But... The crystal cases inside are still perfect. These are the cases like you would put your best action figures in so your kids don't fucking put boogers and peanut butter on them. You you want these humanoids to be preserved well. <laughs> so they get them down to earth, get the case open, and they, just, and they determine these things are dead, start to do an autopsy, and sure enough, this beautiful woman played by Matilda May, and she is gorgeous. This is the, when Daryl mentioned titties, this is what he was talking about. She opens her eyes. 
and sucks the life force out of one of the doctors, turns him almost into beef jerky. It's still his body, but it's like if you took meat or anything and dehydrated it, it becomes shrunken up. You know, it is what it is. That's what happens to this guy, and he drops down dead. And she makes her way out of this hospital, sucking the life force out of all these people, and vanishes into the night. Nothing can stop her. This is at the same time that NASA also realizes, I'm assuming NASA, the escape pod from the shuttle is now approaching the atmosphere. It lands in Texas and they open it up and sure enough, the captain, Tom Carlson, Colonel Tom Carlson, sorry, is inside and he's just wiped out. Three seconds later, he's back in London. (laughs) So they don't mind jumping ahead in this film as they're trying to figure out what the fuck happened. He, he pretty much says that these things were not dead. Bear in mind, there's still two of these things down in the basement at this place, the Space Research Center in London. He says they weren't dead. She came to life. She chose me for some reason, gave me part of her life force and killed everybody else on my crew, took their, took their life force away. And I, I tried to destroy the ship. I, I burnt the, I just tried to destroy it. I set it on fire and I took off because I realized that this could not reach the earth. And they're like, well, welcome back. Colonel Carlson, it happened because she's out walking into the night and the two and what happens in this film that they use, they use a device that we're not privy to until near the end as Carlson kissed her because she called to him in his dreams on the ship and he went to her and she came out of the, she opened up the crystal, kissed him passionately, took some of his life force and gave him some of hers. That way, they're psychically connected. So he uses that connection the whole rest of the film to try to find her because they realize as bodies are popping up along her path that are all shrunk up that uh, she's killing, she's taking life force. Now, the funny part about this is as these dead pieces of gristle come back to life after two hours and stand up like corpses and frantically try to take life force of someone else's away from them. If they don't get it, they pretty much drop and turn to dust. So the special police guy, along with Tom Carlson, take off chasing this woman across, I guess, England, trying to find out where she's going simply by the trail of bodies and him him trying to use his psychic ability to see where she is. Now, we don't find out that the other two guys in the crystal cases that we thought we saw them get, we saw them come back, we saw them get killed. Turns out they weren't killed because these are vampires and they can take the form of anyone, anyone they touch. So they take the form of two security guards and also take off into the night, spreading this around because they have to continually take life force. They have to or else they die unless they're in stasis, apparently, in the ship. And at this time, also, the ship turns from the comet and starts coming towards Earth to find to find its lonely, lost pilgrims. So they end up at a insane asylum where Patrick Stewart is the... Is the is the chief surgeon or physician, whatever. And he's still even in a five had no fucking hair. So I don't know when I'd like to find out when Patrick Stewart lost his hair. It was probably at the age of seven. So I'm not going to ruin what happens at the insane asylum. But the twist when they find where she is and who she's in. And I was shocked. I went, Oh, shit. Is it happened? So. I want you to watch this movie for that scene alone. It was really great. And he forces her, Colonel Carlson forces her out of the body she's inhabited, and he says, it's spreading. Well, and then he realizes, oh my God, it's been spreading this whole time from the other two guys. So as they come back to London by helicopter, it's in flames. And these people are zombies. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people running around the streets. It's weird because they're not sucked up like the gristle people that we've seen before, Probably simply just due to budgetary constraints. You can't make, one, CGI wasn't really going on back then, obviously, in 85. And these practical effects they were making of these corpses must have taken a ton of cash and a ton of time. So you you can do, what, five, six in a film, reasonably? You can't do thousands. So the populace is running around as zombies. They're not sucking life out of people. They're knocking them down, laying on them. It looks like they're eating them, to be honest. And Space Girl, that's how they she's credited, Matilda May, is in, I get not a palace, but uh, it's some, and this is due to my lack of knowledge of the United Kingdom. She's in like some large hall, beautiful marble. Uh, it's like the Hall of Kings or something. And she's inside laying down on a sarcophagus or whatever. She's laying there and the ship is now above Earth 
and it's it's pulling blue light up off of where she's at. Now there's a weird light ball that's going all around the city, and you can see it goes and sucks the the, the blue light out of every, almost everybody it passes. It's taking the life force. It's sending it back up into that ship. And this ship is basically a vacuum cleaner, just sucking up all the life force because these these three, because they tell us it's the last three of their kind, need this life force to live, I guess, when they're not in these little cubes. But when they're in the cubes, they, they're, they're dormant, so they, they want to live. And in the end, we find that they are, they've been to Earth before, maybe not these three, but their people have. They were the vampires of legend, so it wasn't really a legend. And you have to kill them actually by forcing iron into their life force, which is a little bit below their hearts because they've only taken the form of humans. They're not humans at all. They're these weird bat things that were floating around dead, giant things. The ending kind of bothered me because this was a good film. I was very entertained. Uh, Mick Pierce kind of sold it. It was kind of eh, with titties. It was a good film for me anyway. I I found it very, I love 70s and 80s sci-fi and horror films. So I did enjoy this very much. These older films were shot like films, not like just footage to get you from one jump scare cut to the next. You know, these were actually shot as films. So the cop shows up, finds a sword that was used to kill one of the main vampires by a doctor who's now infected himself. And he's dying and he dies. So the special police guy takes this old ancient sword and he goes and kills this second vampire because we only have three vampires we have to worry about. They're the three original carriers. The doctor killed one with the sword. The special police guy killed the second on the steps of where Space Girl was on the inside with a sword. Then he went inside with the sword and finds uh, Tom Carlson, Colonel Carlson, and Space Girl doing it, standing up pretty much. And um, she's taking the life force back from him. His, apparently, and the part she gave him. And she says to him, she's talking to Carlson, we are the same. You are us. You you were supposed to find us. You were supposed to lead us to Earth again. And this is the way it's supposed to be. Just a little more, just a little more. She's taking and sharing the life force with him. Now, this bothered me because the secret police guy yells down at them, hey, and he throws the sword. And for some reason, Carlson knows that I'm supposed to stab this girl through her back, just uh, through her life force area and then into my stomach as well so we both die and he does it without any prompting and he shouldn't have even known that so to me that was really dumb but what happens is it's suddenly the life force turns red around them and instead of blowing up like the other vampires did we saw it twice as the vampires blew up in their human forms and they got stabbed the bodies raise up into this blue light being sucked up into the ship and there's a little bit of red as they go up but we see they go into the ship that's full of this blue light and then they just kind of sail away and the film ends. I really expected that they were dead because they should have been dead by the story's own lore. These people should have died from this. And I, I thought the life force was going to be like, oh, shoot, rocket back out and hit all the people in London. They stand up and like, ah, you know, oh, my God, I feel like shit. No, spaceship just takes right the fuck up. And apparently everybody in it's dead. Or are they? Was there really only three? They don't really explain. I would have been fine, actually, with this film if it had ended, and this was almost a two-hour film, if it had ended in an hour and a half where, at that point, she was just taking off and running and they were starting the chase. If they'd ended the film with, you know what, vampires are real and they came from space and now we're going to try to find this girl as she goes from person to person to person and changes identity into the mist, that would have been fine. That would have been a neat ending. You know, it's like, hey, sometimes the bad guy gets away and we're all fucked. I would have been fine with that. I was also fine with this ending, but it just didn't make that much sense. So at the end, London is destroyed. Who knows how far this is going to spread because we didn't officially see it stop. And if you live in England, well, guess what? You're all dead. Well, at least London anyway. So I don't know. It was a weird ending that was sort of unfulfilling, but six stars out of 10 doesn't lie from 10,000 people. It was a satisfying film. I did like it. I'm I'm blown away. I never saw it. So special thanks to Paul. For emailing in with that, I enjoyed it. On the Berdinsky rating scale, this film would be a borrow. All right, guys, and uh, thanks again to everybody who emailed in suggestions. This is episode 200, and uh, thanks.